name of the Lord. Good morning and praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to the house of the Lord. God is good and his mercy endures forever. Amen. I'm going to have you stand to your feet, please. And uh, we're going to ask that you open your Bibles with us if you have them or, or here on the screen to the book of John, the gospel according to John, chapter 1, verse 9. The testimony says, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was come into the world. And as we enter into December, you see the holiday lights all over the place. You see the, the hubbub and all the people moving around, buying presents, doing things. But we just want to remember today that we have the light, amen, the light of the world. That when he came to this world, the Bible says the world esteemed him not. It didn't look at him. It didn't recognize him. But we are blessed today. We're no different from anybody else. But God has quickened us and made us alive. And so we are blessed today to know the light of Jesus Christ. And to let that light shine in our lives so that we can glorify him everywhere we go. Right there where you are. Why don't you just lift up your hands in the name of Jesus. We bless you, Lord, today. And we thank you, God, for bringing us into your house for the blessing of your love and of your word, Jesus, that satisfies us, that keeps us, that holds us and makes us new, God. We honor you, Lord Jesus, with everything that's in our heart, Lord, with everything that we have. We pray, Lord, that not only in our lives your light would continually shine, but that as we go into this season, Jesus, that we would know you and that we would share with you the light that you have placed inside of us, the light unto salvation. We give you honor and glory today, Lord. We just want to speak your name, Jesus, and glorify you with everything that we have. Hallelujah. Let's give a hand clap to the Lord as we start this service. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. You can keep your hands raised if you can and just meditate on that word. Over every heart Begin to speak that name which is above every name over your situation. Someone say that name, that beautiful name. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there. Someone shout 
with us. Shout Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. the rooftops uh, with the highest praise Lord Jesus we exalt you God he is the reason for the season church if you don't have Jesus in you nothing else matters uh, none of the celebration uh, none of the actions uh, life itself loses its purpose and its meaning if you can't take Jesus by the hand uh, and let him walk you through the next place uh, because anything you do uh, unless the builder buildeth unto the Lord uh, he builds in vain let's build with Jesus today church uh, let's do it in Jesus through him with him and in him uh, for all power and majesty is given unto the Lord our God hallelujah I can do anything I can do all things for it's you who gives me strength nothing is impossible Not your sickness, not your situation, not your job, whatever it is, call upon the name of the Lord and he will respond. I'm not going to live by what I see. I'm not going to live by what I Him. Let's sing that one more time. 
more time. Say, I'm not going to live. I'm not going to live by what I see. I'm not going to live by what I feel. Deep down I know that you're here with me. I know that you can do anything. offering here continue to pray for those needs as we mentioned um, but we're gonna remind everybody that uh, on December 16th the youth have uh, a, a program coming up please see your youth leaders they'll have more details ahead we want to congratulate all of the women that had a wonderful banquet yesterday we hope everybody was able to come and rejoice and have a good time see that picture of our, our beautiful ladies in Christ and the wonderful time that they had yesterday, and I hear there was some good food. I'm a little jealous. Praise God. Uh, there's going to be prayer this week on Thursday. Um, come at 7 o'clock for prayer. Afterwards, we'll go into our Bible studies. Um, this month, we have our regular service next week, 10 o'clock in English, 1130 in Spanish. And then finally, please place on your calendars, if you missed the announcement last week, on the 24th of December, we'll be having a combined service at 10 o'clock. We know that's Christmas Eve. We're not crazy. Jesus deserves the honor and the glory. Amen. You have plenty of time afterwards to go home and prepare that turkey, those tamales, whatever it is you're going to make. In Jesus' name, we'll come celebrate with the family of Christ first, and then you can celebrate with your families at your homes. Uh, speaking of United Services, we'll also have on December 31st, our United Service at 930 at night. So, if you come at 10 o'clock, praise God. That's all right. If you come at 1130, just pray and, and rejoice in the Lord. Uh, maybe go witness to a couple people out in the parking lot and then come back at 930 so we can celebrate together in the name of Jesus. Let's say a prayer right now and ask God to bless our homes, our families. 
This is a difficult time for a lot of people financially, but we're going to pray that God provides everything that the church needs. In the name of Jesus, we give you honor and glory, God. We thank you, Lord, and we pray for your goodness that never fa- never ceases to amaze us, God. It follows us everywhere, Lord Jesus. For we are privileged, Lord, not only to be uh, in this country, in this city, Lord Jesus, a part of your church, but we're privileged, God, be- to be called children of God. And we thank you, Lord, and we pray for the needs of every family, for the needs of our young people, for the needs of the adults, Lord Jesus. Let us not fret about money, but place our faith in you, God. Let us be... Let us be aware, God. Let us plan. Let us budget properly so that we do not overextend, but that we are stewards of the of the work that you've given to us, God. Let us do good, Lord Jesus, in this season. Let us honor and bless you everywhere we go. Let us not be swept away by the feelings of this world, but be stewarded in your spirit and in your love and in your purpose, God. We pray, Lord Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, as as families make tithes to your name, as families give offerings to your name, Lord Jesus, and we ask that you would pour out a blessing over the families of this church here at Calvary Temple, God, that you would bless them, that it would be shaken together and running over, Lord Lord Jesus, and those blessings, God, would be imminent in them, not so that they might boast, but so that they might speak of your glory and your goodness everywhere we go in the precious and mighty name of Jesus. Uh, come on up and give your offering in the name of Jesus. We're going to keep on singing a little bit more as we prepare for the word of God in the name of Jesus. Stepping into what you call us to, we say yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Stepping outside of what we're used to, we say yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Stepping into what you called us to, we say yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Stepping outside of what we're used to, we say yes, Lord. I see the heavens as coming near. I hear the voice of my Savior so clear, calling us deeper, way past our fears. This is our moment. Revival is here. Come on, why don't you lift up your hands? I know it's difficult during this time of year, but get into the presence of God and say, Lord Jesus, revive my heart. Give me strength, Lord, and help me to step into your plan. Stepping into what you called us to, we say yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Stepping outside of what we're used to, we say yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Stepping into what you called us to, we say yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Stepping outside of what we're used to, we say yes, Lord. voice of my Savior so clear, calling us deeper, way past our fear. This is our moment. Revival is here. Lord Jesus, revive us, God. Revival is here. Lord Jesus, let your word be in our hearts and in our revival minds. Revival is here. Everywhere we step, everywhere we go, let us proclaim revival is the here. revival of the Lord. Hallelujah. Revival is raining down. Lord, we receive it. You are always speaking to your people, Lord. Revival is in us now. Lord, we release it. Release each and every one of us, God, in the name of Jesus. Revival is in us now. Lord, we receive it. Revival is in us now. Lord, we release it. Come on, somebody. Lord, we release it. Come on, release it over your family this season. Lord, we release, release that revival it. over your children in the name of Jesus. Lord, we release it. Lord, release it over your church. Lord, we release it. Hallelujah, revival. Revival is here. Yes, Lord, we worship you, Jesus. Revival is here. 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 Come on, in the name of Jesus, right now at this time, we want to dismiss our five loaves, two fish into their classroom, TC2. Everybody, our young children, 7 to 14 or so, 
your uh, teacher is waiting for you in the classroom as we keep on singing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Revival is raining down. Lord, we receive it. Hallelujah, Jesus. Revival is in us now. Lord, we release it. Revival is raining down. Lord, we receive it. Revival is in us now. Lord, we release it. Come on. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. It's good to see everyone in the house of God today. We welcome you. And uh, I invite you today to keep your mind and your heart open to the message. Today, the topic we're going to discuss is discernment. It's something, it's a virtue that's very important and it's much needed in the church and in society today. Discernment is basically a gift from God. It's a wisdom from God to understand and read a situation properly in order that you may make the right decision. And to show you how important discernment is, there's many who lack discernment who, because of that lack, fall into false doctrine, fall into sin easily, uh, are indoctrinated with ideas from the world, and make mistakes. Um... When you have discernment from God, you're able to see a situation and avoid falling into a trap. It's a gift from God and it's much needed in the church, in your life, in your marriage. To see something coming at your marriage requires that discernment and to to be able to fight against it and make the proper decision. To have a healthy and thriving church, you must see and discern what has been done or allowed that is incorrect so that you can correct it. So discernment is very important. Let's, I invite you to open your Bibles to First Chronicles 12 and 32. Discernment is wisdom from God. It's, it allows you to see the traps that Satan lays out for you. It, it allows you to see what is coming against the church, against your life, and it's much needed today. The Bible says, Of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. And we see in this passage of scripture, you may take your seats. The sons of Issachar were mentioned and applauded for having the ability to understand the times, to read the situation, to see in which way things were going. And in this scenario, King Saul was persecuting David as he was in line to be the next king. So we see that it was clear to the sons of Issachar that God's anointing was with David and no longer with Saul. So they threw their support behind King David. They knew where God's will was leading to. They knew what God was trying to do, and they discerned and followed after King David and threw their support. And so while out campaigning against the Philistines in battle, Saul grew impatient waiting for Samuel to come and offer sacrifices to God so that it might go well for him. He was used to this process of having offerings up to God, but he could not wait for the man of God to come, for the prophet. And he offered up the sacrifice himself, assuming the responsibility that he had not been authorized to do. So in this scenario, We see the sons of Issachar having discernment following after King David, knowing that God's anointing was with King David. And then we see King Saul doing the opposite, lacking discernment and getting impatient and trying to do things that were out of order. So he offers up the sacrifice himself, and God said, this is not correct. This is a strange fire. You're out of order. You're doing things. You're getting ahead of yourself. You're being impatient and not waiting on God and allowing him to do things the way he needs to do them properly. 
And for this, we, we see that he had the opposite. He had that lack of discernment to know that is not my place to offer up the fire. If Samuel is being held up, if he's being late, then I still need to do things correctly. And how many people are seeing a situation and they get impatient? Well, God's not answering my situation. I see my situation not changing. And incorrectly, because of lack of discernment, many people say, well, let me help God out a little bit. How many have heard that before? Let, let me go do this because, you know, uh, God's not answering my prayer. Things aren't happening fast enough. Amen? So discernment is important. You have to know and understand what's going on. So God's favor and anointing was removed from Saul and placed over David. And Saul was not accepting his personal responsibility or his actions. He was chasing after David. Instead, would it not have been better to say, Lord, forgive me for doing things improperly, for being hasty, for jumping ahead of the line, for doing things out of order and incorrectly, maybe God would have had mercy on him a little bit and allowed him to, to leave on better terms his kingdom to the next in line. So discernment is important. Why is discernment important? Discernment is important because, for example, if you send your child to a university that is pushing this radical agenda that goes against every biblical principle that we were founded on, that this country was founded on at one time. And it's interesting to me that most, if, most universities, the old ones, the ones that were, were around in colonial times, were, were founded with Christian principles. And to now fast forward and see that they're indoctrination camps, where people go to university and come back an atheist, come back a radical socialist, and this is why the church and parents and Christians need discernment to understand. It, it would be better for you to find, find them a, a university that is more conservative, a Christian university, or do not let them go to those indoctrination camps. Send them to a trade school instead. And if uh, you have discernment and you see th the way things are going in your child's school, it's better to pull them out and homeschool them. Or send them to a Christian school. Because you will be saving their life. You will really be saving their life. You're keeping them aligned with Christian principles. And this society is going continually against us. And we have to have the discernment and wisdom. For yourself at work, somebody starts being really nice to you and sweet. You have to have that discernment to say, oh no, I know where this is going. I need to avoid this person. This is a trap. I could fall into sin. And that's what discernment does. It's a gift from God. It's that wisdom to read a situation. Amen? Let's, let's look at Luke 12, 54 through 56. Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be hot weather, and there is. Hi hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Jesus reprimanded the people of his time because they had no discernment. The very God of heaven, their creator, had taken on bodily form and walked among them, and they could not discern the Messiah was in front of them. He said, how do you guys not see what is in front of you, what you are being partakers of at this moment? How do you not understand and get this? And when you have discernment, you're able to see and read those situations. If someone stands before this pulpit and starts preaching false doctrine, let me tell you something. A lot of people have a talent and ability for speaking. They, they present well. They get the crowd excited and they say things in a marvelous way. Oh, we're going to walk into a deeper dimension, right? And they even have the inflections and everything, ah, ha, ha, right? But if you do not understand and have that wisdom and discernment from God, if you do not know Scripture, you can fall into a false doctrine and be pulled away to some, oh, that church is huge, they're a mega church, let me go over there. God's anointing must be with the crowd. It can be, but not always. Bless you. 
So we see and understand that discernment is important. You must know what you are following because I would rather be at a church in a rancho with dirt floors where the Holy Spirit is being outpoured and the people are saturated with the Holy Spirit than a mega church that has false doctrine. If someone stands up, up here and begins to preach false doctrine, do we have the discernment to know it and to correct it and not follow it? Or a new movement. Every so often there's a new movement in the church and everybody's going here, going there. This is the book to read. This is the, this is the process that's going to grow your church. But if we don't have discernment, those are just words and steps and movements. Is it truly aligned with the Word of God? If it aligns with the Word of God, so be it. But we have to have that discernment. So you see that these people were religious Jews. That's another thing I always speak against, just religion. Religion is just laws, rules, mandates. But true Christianity, true service to God encompasses those rules and laws, but with love and with discernment, with knowledge, with wisdom. God is transforming us to be true individuals that understand and follow after God with all their heart. You see, there's a difference between saying, oh, I'm, you fill in the blank with the religion, but do you really understand and have a relationship with your God? Because it's all about relationship, not religion. Religion is just a set of laws. This is, this is what we do. This is what we don't do. I have friends from different religions, coworkers, and they say, oh, we don't celebrate birthdays. We don't, there's just rules and laws. But Christianity is about getting to know your God intimately and working on transforming your life and modeling yourself after our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We model ourselves after him. We follow after him. We, we want to be more like him every day. He was compassionate and loving and caring. He cared about people. He was constantly healing the sick. He was feeding the poor. So if we are not radically changed in that way in our hearts, then we are still lacking. We have to every day be more Christ-like, amen? And one thing I know about my Christ, he was filled and flowing with love and compassion. And he saw a need and he was meeting it. And that's what we need to do, church, is have that discernment and wisdom to see the danger and avoid it and become every day more like Christ. And true discernment from God is the understanding of the times that we live in. And right now, I'm sure you all see society attacking all the biblical foundational beliefs. Amen? Now with the craziness that I hear out there, and my Bible tells me, that there are still and always will be two genders. If you don't believe it, go try to milk a bull. See if you get any milk. There's only two genders. And marriage was established to be between a man and a woman for the purpose of procreating all the wonderful, beautiful little babies I see in here. That's the purpose. And even marriage has a purpose. You're to build a bond with that individual. You are to understand the heart of Christ through marriage and family. To, I've always said that the family is the most beautiful model where God exhibits and makes us understand. Because in a marriage, you, you have to understand Christ in the way he was. Do you not learn patience, all you married folks? You learn patience. You learn tolerance. You learn compassion because no matter how much, and there's no one like your spouse that knows how to hit the right buttons or the wrong buttons, however you want to look at it, right? No one could set you off like your spouse. But it is also a beautiful, wonderful relationship where you learn to forgive one another. You learn to live. And you're, you're two genders to begin with and two families, two backgrounds. So you bring that all into the mix, it, it could be problematic, but you learn to adapt and to change. Just like God with us, he said, yes, I know how you are, but in that relationship, you learn compassion, and you see how God is loving and caring after the church. He has, God has a, <laughs> he has, God has a huge family, children, 
and he is patient with us. And I think sometimes he must look at us and say, my goodness, again, Reuben, with the same thing? But God is loving and caring, and he wants to transform us to also take that into our marriage and family. Love your children, but also discern the dangers that come against them and guard them, because it's time for us to stand up for what is right. And since these attacks against our, us as believers, we must fight against it. Do not let your kids get lost in all of that. Be, have the discernment and wisdom to protect them, to teach them the foundational beliefs that we have. That they may stand also on the same beliefs because the Bible is still true. The Word of God is still true. And the biblical principles that founded this nation are still the best values to have. Amen? Yes. A lot of mental illness out there right now, but we need to fight against it. And if you do know someone who's lost in all that mess, have the love and compassion to pray for them, teach them the, the wisdom of God, the biblical principles. And, you know, discernment is even to understand when we are in error. Because King Saul, he did what was wrong. He offered up sacrifices when it was not his place. That's like... That's, that's uh, let me say, that's the equivalent of someone being allowed to preach out here behind this pulpit that is not baptized, that is not seasoned, that is not prepared. Just, just let anybody walk up here. And I even dare to say, let, let's say somebody says, there's this great musician, he's amazing, he's going to help us out this Sunday because we're, we're lacking a bass player. Well, where is he from? Oh, he's from the world. He plays in a rock band, but he's really good. Should he be up here? No. This, this, this is ministry. That would be strange fire. A preacher, a man from off the street, he, oh, he's a, he's a motivational speaker. I think he'll do well. Give him a topic and he'll do well, perhaps. But should he be up here? No. If I'm up here by the grace of God, I, I also... Let me tell you, I paid a price. A lot of studying, a lot of growth, a lot of suffering, a lot of tests from God to be up here. So I don't take it lightly. I know what I went through. And, and the equivalent of not recognizing something like that could be damaging to the church to allow strange fire, something out of order. Someone who has no business preaching or ministering being allowed to just because there's a need is dangerous. And we must understand that. And so Saul did not even recognize. He said, oh, I'm doing a good thing. There's a need for the sacrifice to be brought up. And Samuel is nowhere to be found. Let me step in. No, that was wrong. But the fact that he didn't know it was wrong or didn't care shows about his character is why he was removed and replaced with King David. And so discernment also for when you are in error is important. You need to recognize, wait a minute, let me not be stubborn. Let me understand, Lord, things are going wrong. Am I in error? Do I have that wisdom and discernment to say, yes, I think I'm in error? It could be me. Perhaps it's me. <laughs> not like some, some, there's individuals I've met that it, it has to be everything and everyone else. It couldn't, couldn't be me. It could never be me. It must have been I remember one time in traffic, some, always traffic, right? <laughs> my Achilles heel. But I, something happened, and I'm like, whoa, that guy and my wife, always honest with me, says, no, that was you. You could have you mitigated that situation because you did this and that. I'm like, pa que dije? Why did I bring it up? <laughs> but we have to have the discernment to recognize also when we are in error. You know, I, I often... I often have shared this story. One time I was fresh out of Bible college and I thought I was, I thought I was super consecrated and I, 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 I prayed the prayer of King David where he says, you know, search my heart, O God. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me and keep me in the way everlasting. And I said that prayer almost thinking there, there's no way anything is going to come back, Pastor. I'm good. I'm consecrated. I'm prayed up. And then he reminded me of one area where I was lacking. He said, how about this area? I'm like, oh, why did I bring, why did I pray so boldly? <laughs> I was like, ouch, yes. 
So we have to be honest with ourselves, examine ourselves, be open with God and say, Lord, teach me, show me, how do I keep my family in harmony? How do I restore my marriage? How do I improve my life? How do I improve my work situation? How do I keep my children from that indoctrination that's outside trying to grasp them, trying to even the little ones already with the drag queen story hour? What is that? Little ones. I'm sorry, but little ones, all they need to do, they're innocent. All they need is A, B, C, one, two, three. Let them live. Leave them alone. And so if you don't have the discernment to see what's going on around the world, even on the prophetic scale, we all know what's happening in Israel, the Arab world. You read Ezekiel 38 and you, you see, wow, this is, you know, you start to understand, if you have discernment, that the time is near for Christ's return. And there's no time to be playing church. Does it, I just go to church to, you know, I... Somebody that's very close to me would say that they go to church just so that their mother-in-law stops nagging them. Is that a valid reason, Pastor? You have to have a transformed heart. You have to really love God and get, get your life in order. Whiten your robes, church, because Christ is coming soon. It's not time to be playing around. There's a society out there attacking the biblical foundational beliefs. They're attacking us. The society is going against us. And then you see the prophetic going on in the world, politics, the push for a cashless society. Didn't we read that in Revelation as kids? We know what's coming. It's not time to be playing around, church. It's time to get a hold of the horns of the altar and plead to God, help me, help me and my family. Give me the discernment and wisdom to always protect and see the attacks of the enemy coming and have an answer. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Romans 13, 11 through 14 says this. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. We have to put on Christ, church. Putting on Christ means to adapt to his principles, his rules, his laws, his way of thinking. We have to put on Christ, put on that armor, because it is... We are at war at this time. And, and, and many of you are losing children, family members to this fight. Maybe even you have lost a step or two in your walk with God. And God is calling his church to put on Christ once again. Protect against the evil that is out there. Protect against the world that is attacking the nuclear family. If you, if you recognize and read what's going on, they're basically trying to destroy the traditional family. Because if there's such a push for this LGBTQ confusion, what are the numbers going to be for the next generation? There's going to be less babies, less children. They're trying to attack the nuclear family and destroy it. They want your children. And if you do nothing about it, they will have them. Because if you do not teach your children what you believe, the scriptural principles, if you do not teach them to serve God, then you're leaving them out to the world in whatever they believe. And they will adapt that. And what they believe is far from what you want them following. Trust me. Horrible. But it is our job to have that discernment and wisdom and begin to teach them, to hold them back. And so here it says to put on Christ. Because the times we live in are a clear sign of the end of the age. You see, I know not everyone studies prophecy perhaps, but you need to understand that the things that are going on in the world right now are all a push for a one world government, cashless society, one world leader. Even the European Union uh, has voted on in times of war, they want to elect one individual to head all of the European Union and make military decisions for them. 
And we all know where all this is going. We've read this. So if we do not do anything about it, if we stay comfortable in our walk with God, you know, the Bible says that if it were possible that even the elect (laughs) might be deceived by the Antichrist in this whole system that's coming. So do not be one of the ones who's toggling and, I don't know, it sounds pretty good to, to not have to carry out around a wallet in cash. Everything's right here on a digital chip. That sounds good to me. I don't know. It's pretty convenient. And for those who say, oh, you, you shouldn't be a fanatic. You know, I believe in God. I don't need to be a fanatic. I don't need to go to church all the time and be that <laughs> dedicated. There's, a, there's an enemy out there who wants you ruined. He wants to ruin your family, your walk with God. He wants you, every family, to be destroyed. And we need that discernment from God to see the warning signs, to see what's coming. Like the sons of Issachar who said, we know that God's anointing is with David. We see it. We read the signs. The evidence is there. We also need to see what's going on in the world and say, I need to draw closer to God. Because they're, these times are perilous, and they're going to get worse. And the worst thing is that this world, the majority of this world does not follow God, does not follow after Christ. So when you go against the grain, you're going to have opposition. And when the Antichrist begins to be rolled out in his new world order system, what do you think is going to come against us? Persecution. And if you're not ready, if you're toggling between both worlds, you might just give in. And say, oh, it's easier to just go with the system. The government says we have to do this. I guess we got to do it. Have discernment, church. Know what's coming. Read the signs. Know that the end is near and we must be prepared. Because I don't know about you, but I want to fly away. When the Lord comes, I don't want to be around here to find out how difficult it's going to be to resist the new world order. I want to be with my Lord. So I'm reading the signs, I'm exercising discernment, and I'm getting ready. Get ready, church, get ready. Amen. And all this age is pushing back against everything that we believe in. And there's a battle. There's a battle that's going on, and we need to understand. First Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21 says this, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good. What does that mean? That means you need to understand and see and be able to read what is good, what is godly. Like I said before, someone could come and preach, has a real talent for speaking in public, very well spoken, uses big words, but if it does not align with scripture, I gotta throw it out. Got to say no. Well spoken, but uh, and uh, my brother and I, when <laughs> when I was younger, um, before I got married, uh, my brother and I shared an apartment, and we would <laughs> we would turn on turn on the TV and listen to all the evangelists, televangelists, and we were uh, we called ourselves the heresy hunters, and we would have our notepad and our Bible, and we were trying to catch false doctrine, false teachings. And so there we were, pastor, listening to them preach. And they spoke well. They sounded well. They presented well. But my brother would be like, ah, 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 ah. Isaiah 32 says this. and That's false. Hey, that's wrong. He's, one, one preacher even said that we're all small gods. The Bible doesn't teach that. It doesn't teach that. Or the ones who teach the prosperity gospel. Have you heard of that? They say, if you're not wealthy and rich, there must be sin in your life or something's wrong. No. You know, (laughs) no. You know when you become wealthy? When you work hard and are disciplined? You know, God blesses and rewards us with what we need. If you have anything beyond that, it's your work ethic and your discipline and your hustle. Don't let no one take that away. And so they teach that if, you're, that if you're not wealthy, if you're not rich, if you don't have that Bentley, that, that something's wrong. No, God doesn't operate that way. Amen? 
So all these false doctrines, if you need to be able to test the spirits and see what is good. Even me, I guarantee you, what, if you have any questions, re-listen to the sermon. Anything I say, go see if the Bible backs it up. Don't just believe me because, oh, Brother Ruben's a nice guy and he's, you know, I, we get along well. Let me believe everything he says. No, even me. Be like the Bereans and say, wait a minute, is that really true? Does the Bible really say that? Because if I present it well, but if it's off, then it's off. And God is asking the church today to have healthy discernment, understanding of the word, protect your family, know when things are coming against you and your family, and protect against it. Even if they stand upon the pulpit, let us be like the sons of Issachar who were applauded for having the understanding and discernment. To know where God is is trying to take the church what he's trying to do because sometimes God is shaking up a church for a reason. He wants change. He wants change. He wants something to change. You see, because a lot of the times we we think that uh, our prayer is not answered because it's not God's timing, but sometimes it's God's waiting on you for some reason. There's something that you're lacking that you're not doing or something you need to start doing, and we always put it on someone else. Well, you know, it's not God's timing yet. Maybe it was, and it blew past a dozen times because you still have not done what you need to do. We don't like it when it's on us, right? When, it, when the responsibility, when the onus is back on us, we don't like it. What do you mean I have to change something? What do you mean I have to do something? God, just answer my prayer already. And he's waiting on you to make changes that perhaps he's been waiting on for some time. And that comes with discernment. With discernment, you'll understand, oh, wait a minute. Yes, I understand what God's trying to do. And sometimes I remember um, many times having that revelation when I'm asking for something, and then God would turn it around on me, the mirror, and say, I'm waiting on you. Oh, I have to do something. I have to change something. Yes, many times that's the case. And may God prepare our hearts for what is to come and help us build our walk and relationship so that we may strengthen our families, our marriages, our relationships. For those of you who have children that are still unsaved, that are far from God, do not lose hope. Do not lose hope because there's, a, there's power in prayer. And God is still listening. Amen. There's power in prayer. If you have a spouse that is still not saved, understand that there is a time and a place for this. You just keep fighting for that one that you love. You know, sometimes we don't understand the things that need to happen. Sometimes there's steps, and sometimes God wakes people up through different ways. But God loves you, loves your children loves your spouses that are far off, that need correction. But we need to be a family that fights for one another. Amen? If any of you see someone here that's not here, that used to be here, that used to come regularly, don't just blow it off like, okay, whatever, I guess they're back in the world or something went wrong. Call them, look after them, be a family of God. Just one call. You don't know how many times someone just needs one text message or a call that'll make a difference. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 9 in closing says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet of the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
The church needs to be at this time, if you're discerning what's going on around the world, and even in the church, there's many falling away. They're being enticed by the world and what the world is presenting. And you know, a lot of people say, oh man, yeah, I grew up in the apostolic church. Oh, so many rules and laws. I'm out. I'm out of here. And they get drawn away from the world, but they don't see the value and the beauty of remaining faithful to the, to the gospel, faithful to, the, to God, and sticking close to the family of God. They, they lose that value, and they, they get lost in the world, and they begin to believe what's out there. I've lost family members to that, that grew up in the church, but the draw of the world, what they're presenting, sounds better. It makes them feel good about themselves because the devil will always, he will always validate your sin. No, you were born that way. Don't worry about it. And it's okay. What you're doing is okay. But God today is calling a church to stand and to fight for what's right because the world is coming against us and we need to be prepared. We need to fight for what is right. As the church empties out sometimes, people begin to go back to the world, back to their sin. Those of us who remain, the Bible always talks about a remnant. What does it say? That the road is narrow and there's few that find it. So if you find yourself in the minority, you find that your friends say, oh, what's wrong with with all the the things that society is presenting. It's, it's okay, you know. Uh, there's a hundred genders. Yeah, it's okay. You're, yeah. Cool, I'm with that too. No. We have to stand for what is right. There's a war against the family and against the church. And God says, discern the times and learn to stand and to fight for what is right. Because Christ is coming soon, church. He's coming for a church that has not been soiled by the world and does not care if they say what they say is normal, that you know what's right and you live by it and you raise your children to those same standards. Church, I invite you to stand. Let's let's ask God to give us strength to live in these times when what we believe is being attacked and what we stand for is being ridiculed as old-fashioned and not understanding. I don't know about you, but this society has gone insane. The things that they're teaching and that they're saying are the norm, are just out of this world. You know, back in the day, people who spoke that way were put into a nut farm. Not Bates Nut Farm, a loony bin. They were put in the loony bin for talking that way and saying, oh, I believe, you know, I identify as a, as a 15-year-old boy. What's wrong with this guy? Put the, lock him up. You know, I believe that I'm, uh, you know, I don't know. You all know what I'm talking about. But God is calling a church to stand for something and prepare yourself because the rapture is around the corner. I guarantee you. The Bible says to not put dates. I don't believe in date setting or trying to do the math. Don't even bother. But you see, God says the sons of Issachar had discernment. They were able to read the signs and knew where God's favor was. And we also need to have discernment and say, I see where the world is going, pushing for a global government, a one world religion, cashless society, all spoken about in Revelation, the times to come. And a lot of people falling away from the church, yet us who stand are the light and salt of this earth. So do not let yourself be soiled by the world but be that salt and that light that the world needs because someone needs to hear the gospel and you and I are the ones to share with them. Even if si nos quedamos diez in this church, we need to stand for God and be those 10 that can go out and still share the gospel to maybe even hopes of winning one soul to Christ. It is worth it, church. Stand for your family. Stand for your faith. Do not fall. For, for sin and society. I invite you to this altar. Let us ask God to strengthen us, to strengthen our families and to restore our families, our marriages, our children. 
God can do it. He's still the God of miracles. Heavenly Father, we ask you, Lord, every family, every marriage that needs help, Lord Jesus, that you step in and you begin to mend and fix what needs to be fixed, Lord Jesus. We love our family, Lord Jesus. We want them to be aligned with your gospel, with your message, Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord, to not fail you. Help us, Lord, to follow in line with what you are doing, Lord Jesus. Save our marriages, save our families, Lord Jesus. So let's dance in your presence, dance in your presence. King of glory, build this place. We just want to be with you. Just want to be with you. stir in your heart, stir in this place in the name of Jesus. For we do not take confidence in flesh and blood, but our confidence is in the Spirit of the Lord, which directs and leads and guides. And if you feel God guiding your heart right now through the Word of God, through His Spirit, acknowledge it. Acknowledge it in your mind. Acknowledge it in your heart and tell Him, yes, Lord, I will do it. Yes, Lord, I will do it. I will follow in your ways. I will listen. I will hear and I will do. For the word of God says, don't be hearers only, but be doers of the word. It's where the strength of the Lord comes, church, when you are doers and not just hearers. Praise be the name of God. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Reuben, for the message of the Lord today. May God bless you and grant you more understanding and wisdom to continue to speak to this church to speak to this generation. How good is the goodness of God, church? Amen? Amen, amen. We're going to be dismissed here in just a moment. Um, I want to remind everybody as we get into this time of year, share the love of Christ, amen? Share the love of Christ. Don't hold back. Don't be afraid. You know the truth, amen? You know the truth. And Jesus wants to set people free. Amen? Don't ever think or believe, well, they don't want this or they don't. Jesus wants to set people free. For it is the will of God that none shall perish, but that all shall receive everlasting life. Whoever you feel God calling to speak to, for you to speak to, pray about it. Amen? Ask the Lord for that direction, but then do it in Jesus' name. Do it in Jesus' name. Let's say a prayer and we'll be dismissed in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for this message today, God. Thank you for your word that is dwelling in our hearts as we pray right now, Lord Jesus. Let this word grow roots in us, God. Let it speak to our heart all the week through. Let it prepare us for what you have in store for us, Lord Jesus. Not only individually, but as a church. Prepare us, Lord Jesus, for what's coming in the year ahead. Prepare us, God. Let us not look so shortly just to this month, but let us begin to see into 2024. Let us begin to see into the next, the next phase, the next stage of our life, Lord. Where whether we are young, whether we are older, whether we are midlife, Lord Jesus, wherever we are in our lives, Lord Jesus, help us to see into the next level, the next place you want us to be, Lord. That our hearts may be stirred, that our minds may be prepared, God, and that our spirits would lead toward you in the name of Jesus, Lord. Bless these beautiful people as they go home today, Lord. Bless their hearts and their minds. Keep them in your care. Keep them safe, Lord Jesus. Let your spirit be in us everywhere we go. 
in the name of Jesus. We're dismissed, church. If you say hallelujah, amen, give the Lord a hand clap and have a wonderful week in the name of Jesus.